everyone. Welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. And this evening, we are joined by some very special guests. Every artist, whether a painter, musician, writer, or actor, can point to a mentor who's inspired their love of the arts. Today, Empire's Terrence Howard and Taraji P. Henson, as well as executive producers Senna Hamri and Brett Mahoney, are joining us to talk about the importance of arts and education. We'll also be joined by Winston Cox, Director of Implementation for Turnaround Arts, an organization committed to bringing innovative art programs and arts-based learning to schools. But first, let's check out a clip from Empire. Hey, hey, put that back. Don't you touch my Derek Adams. Art is a, its own character, I think, in the show. I really wanted to show the art of Empire. I wanted the art to stand out as much as the acting and as much as the fashion and as much as the music. I'm Derek Adams, a visual artist working in multimedia. Late May, I received a call from Empire. They want to do a portrait of Cookie and Lucius. I was immediately on board. I mean, it's Empire. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? Well, my typical day just as an artist is pretty basic. After walking from my house, grabbing a coffee at the local coffee shop and talking to the neighbors. That looks great. That looks great. I'm really connected to the people around here. So coming to the studio is exciting because you get to come into a space with white walls and create a world. The goal is to bring all that that's happening in the show through this object and see how people respond to it based on these two characters who are bigger than life. A uh, little advice, be careful of those lines. You know they bite. It's interesting to try and imagine what his thinking was in painting Lucius and Cookie and how the geometry and the lines played to his interpretation of what Cookie and Lucius are. I'm quite flattered by it. For me, it's the colors. Very warm, lots of browns. It's very beautiful. When I looked at both figures, I didn't see one being more dominant than the other. And so I wanted to give the viewers their own perspective in looking at these two figures. I thought that splitting the image in half would create this idea of looking at the two figures as equal, as being both dominant in their own way. Joining them together automatically kind of brought this idea of that they were one, but also they're looking away from each other which implies that they're both in their own world. I want people to look at this painting. I want them to get a sense of black excellence in the way that I feel the show is capturing this idea. The beautiful thing about Lucius and Cookie is there's this love-hate battle taking place with them. Derek was able to tap into that. Everyone, please put your hands together for Terrence Howard, Taraji P. Henson, Winston Cox, Senna Homry and Brett Mahoney. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're so happy to be here. Yeah, and about such an amazing and I think important topic. So just bouncing off of that video we just watched, I mean, having the art integrated into the show like that, why is that so important? And whoever wants to take that first, I don't know. I think that's the producers. Yeah, Senna, do you have? Well, I mean, it all started with Lee Daniels who really wanted to show um, art, especially people of color, artists who are not represented in the art world on television in like a really great way. And with that said, we decided to curate all different artists from, you know, we have Derek Adams, Michelaine Thomas, um, Omar, Diop, like there's so many that we've had on our show so that they're front and center and part of the production design. It's not like an ancillary moment. It is the moment. And why was Derek's art something that was especially important to incorporate? Uh, I think it's just a matter of, I mean, he's such a preeminent artist. Such a preeminent artist, and to have him do a portrait of Cookie and Lucius, it just allowed us to celebrate that, but also to celebrate his art. Let's talk about that portrait. When you guys saw it for the first time, what do you think? Because it is so beautiful and so cool, and every time you look at it, you see something different, you know? My first thought was it doesn't look like me, but it feels like me. My, all of the he certainly dressed like that. My, look at his shirt, it kind of looks like that. But my first thought was, yes, I have the same color eyes as Terrence. <laughs> No, it's cute, and I do see me in there. Yeah, I see a lot of you there. I like how they made it. It's two heads, but it's one, because that's pretty much how Cookie and Lucius operate. They're one right, person. Right, yeah. And also, neither one is necessarily more dominant. They, right. both, they work as a team in partnership. <laughs> well, that's how big your head is in real life, Terrence. <laughs> but it's really just so powerful and yeah. striking, like they are as a couple. Yeah, definitely. 
He's the why I don't want to be the square. He's the square. I'm joking. <laughs> so what role do artists play in society? Because we see all the time people reflecting what we're seeing in our own communities. So why was that an important important part? Or you know, because the artists that are chosen are they have a message. It's always a visually arresting message that we don't usually see, nor does um, modern day mainstream society accept. So what we do is to try to do what's unacceptable to other people, but is what reflects us as a people. And our struggles, our joy, our pain, that's what art is about. It's the inner emotion of the people, just like music is, just like Marvin Gaye was for the time, and in fact, just as important as now. May I add, I think that the role of the artist as a disruptor, as an antagonizer, is something that we really need and we're sadly lacking. And so a show like this to promote that concept of the artist as disruptor, as get engaging young people, I think that fires their imagination and is really positive development. With art regarding children, or human beings, period. Art is an expression of communication. It's an attempt to communicate. And like a coral snake, the art on its body is so definitive and tells you exactly what this characteristics of these snakes are, you know, whether it'll kill you, whether it'll be friendly, what all these different things. So art is an immediate identifier of who and what you want to represent. And it can change, you can change, as human beings, we can change our perception by how we artfully decorate ourselves. And you can change, like, like uh, Mr. Rogers, he would use art in the sense of changing the emotion. A smile, when you're normally carrying a frowny face, becomes artistic. A hello, and how you say hello. Art is not just for the writing, and it's, it's really in how you are expressing yourselves. And you want to express yourself like Da Vinci, like Picasso. You want for everyone to know that you exist and that the message you have to give is something that's welcoming. Which is something you and Taraji and the rest of the actors, I think, on the show do every day, where you are living your art and really sharing it with your viewers. Who we have in the audience today, we have a bunch of eighth graders who are in the turnaround program. And so <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys, uh, what were you doing in the eighth grade? And were you into the arts then? Or was it something that you had found at that time? Eighth grade, how old was I? Is that 14? Yeah. 14? 13. 13. 13. Oh, duh. Hi, this thing. Um, I was, yeah, I was, my, my acting, my, my acting uh, was awakening in me. I think I was at a, um, the school I was at. Oh, as a matter of fact, I did Shakespeare for the first time in the eighth grade. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember which play? I did, uh, we were the three witches. Which one is that? Hamlet. Uh, Hamlet. Hamlet. Mm -hmm. We were the three witches. Macbeth? Yeah. Macbeth. 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 You got me out here looking like I don't know my Shakespeare. It was Macbeth, and we were the th and I play. I was one of the of the three witches, and it was for the uh, Folgers Theater Shakespeare Festival, and at, and they were giving out awards. You, it was a competition, and they didn't have a. We were so good because we were like the only black kids there. And um, we were so good, they created an award for us that day. And yeah, we went back to the hood. Our school was like, wow! <laughs> they was like, woo, we got a award. Who is Shakespeare? <laughs> In eighth grade, um, what was I doing? Um, I remember being introduced to the idea of light and how, the, how each color of light had a different expression and meant something. And I was looking up the different ways that people in different regions called the different colors to see if they there was a match to it, if there was some type of etymology to light and color. You knew that word at eight? Yes. Wow. Yes, I knew He's etymology. <laughs> no, but I wanted to see the relationship between light and color, sound and tone, and matter and shape at that time. So it's all about art and wanting to grab as many supplies in your lifetime in every situation so you can create the collage of your life because that will be the art of your life. And some people will be like Basquiat and some people's art will be like Kaczynski, you know? But everything you do is a brushstroke for your ultimate life masterpiece. Do you think that creativity is something everyone has, or is it something that has to be kind of cultivated? Everyone has person? it. 
We're made by a creator, by by a creator, and the creation can only imitate the creator. So if he's creating, then we, if he or she or the whatever that force is, is a creating force, then everything we do should be giving praise to being alive and expressing that same thing and create. But I think at the same time, whereas we all have it, it has to be nurtured. And I think that's why art in schools is so important. So that for these kids who stumble upon or feel that creativity to have it nurtured, supported, and so that they can continue in it. Yeah, I agree. It should be like within the curriculum, just as much as math is, as to music, art, you know, and science. I mean, it's part of everything. Absolutely. We we really see that in our schools. We see the way that the arts fire their imagination, re-engage them, really channel them. Uh, these are these is this is what they were meant to do. They were created to do it, as Terrence said. And uh, it's incredible to see what happens when you really nurture the arts in schools. Yeah. And. and no, I was just saying, like all of you guys, you, you guys are in eighth grade. You guys all have the color blue on. Do you know what shape the color blue is? Just think about that. Do you know what element would be the closely closest related thing to the color blue? The color blue would make the color not the key of the key of G. That's how it. That's what you hear, and it sounds like the prime resonant frequency of nitrogen. That's what the color blue can do for you. That's what it means. That's 192 to 196 hertz. That's, so in understanding these things, when you do take a picture and look at it, you know, if, if you understand the art and you can manipulate how people feel because nitrogen is in our DNA. And so if nitrogen is high, then everybody's happy because it preludes oxygen. I'm saying all these things are closely related. So art is not just about expressing, ex ex expressing abstract ideas. It's about understanding how the universe works as a whole. And if you master it, you can master the universe. For every color, there is a sound. For every sound, there is a shape. Once you find the relationship, you have all the tools necessary to master life. Yes, that's for sure. And it shows that art, the arts influence business and science and technology and all of that stuff. It all kind of goes hand in hand. Before we go on, I want to quick throw to a, a clip from Turnaround Art so people can see a little more what we're talking about. So I think we have that clip ready. Sometimes I'm right and I can be wrong. My own beliefs are in my songs. Butcher the baker, the drummer, and then makes no difference what group I'm in. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 For Turnaround Art. Yeah. So, Winston, I'm going to start with you. What are some of the initiatives that you guys bring into schools? We, uh, we bring about a lot of change to a school environment. So as when we partner with a collection of schools, uh, we're really um, providing professional development for teachers in terms of arts integration. How do, you, how do you use the arts in science, in math, in English language arts to really uh, capitalize and engage uh, student learning? Uh, we also, um, in the first year of our turnaround arts school, they receive um, a significant amount of uh, art supplies as well as musical instruments to really, again, to uh, inspire the students, those who uh, would uh, pursue those lines. And we, over time, what we see is that the school increasingly, uh, you see more and more engagement for, from students and they really, you know, they capture their imagination. What would you say is the greatest impact you've seen in students? Is it is there performance outside of the classroom, inside the classroom? Like, what do you think is the real takeaway from having this impact in the schools? I think the fact that they see themselves in the curriculum, mm -hmm. that they understand that that history and science and math that these are all that they contributed greatly uh, to all of those disciplines, and uh, and right, they are now an an activated, enabled uh, student. And there, we just see that level of inspiration and commitment moving forward into the higher levels of education. Yeah. That's something you guys can relate to. Did you have arts in your school like that, or was it? I know budget cuts kind of always mess up that. We're so. we're old enough to have been around before the budget cuts, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where I found that's where I found art in school. Mm. Um, we had that's when we had to take uh, music. Um, I remember fifth grade. And I wasn't in a private school. It was just school in Northeast um, D.C. It doesn't exist anymore, Kingsman. <laughs> but um, uh, I did my very first play there, fifth grade. And my teacher, I was a very rambunctious child in class. I wouldn't be quiet. So she knew how to channel that energy. And she put me on the stage. And that's what awakened the actor inside of me. Fifth grade, Mrs. Lane, I'll never forget her. Uh -huh. Terrence, did you have any mentors when you were young that sort of helped you find art? Or is it something that came to you? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little different. Uh, only because, you know, I have synesthesia. So when I see color, I hear sound. When, when I hear sound, I, I sense shape. So everything has always been art to me. That's why I was asking them to take a look and see what they understand and not to for forget and forsake that you might see things a little different than everybody else. And it's okay to feel like that. So most of the teachers, I was pretty disruptive too, <laughs> you know, but they would suspend me <laughs> instead of um, nurturing it. But... I wasn't as pretty as Taraji was. <laughs> <laughs> and Winston, I read that you guys have different murals throughout the school and students art up all, all over the place. That's right, transforming the school environment, really making it feel like theirs, uh, having parent events, engagement events where the parents really feel welcome. Uh, it really, you, you feel the difference. We want you to walk into that school and really sense that something has changed in that learning environment. And uh, our halls are, you know, uh, brimming with uh, that joy for learning. Mm. This, the many years of the obsession sort of with standardized testing, albeit a, a portion, but it has really done a number on our teachers and our students. Some have really uh, needed a sort of reawakening, a connection to the learning experience. And what I'm finding right now, I think we're putting so much emphasis on the government on our on our schools teaching certain things but really it's f the selfish gene that runs in everything and keeps everything going that selfish gene lives in you and if you're not being taught you need to seek and ask and seek out those questions because they're necessary for you to live you should Question everything. Disrupt as much as you can. <laughs> Question the platonic solids. Don't accept them like, oh, well, they've been here for 6,000 years. Question the reality that every, all energy in the universe is expressed in motion. All motion is expressed in waves. So where does the straight lines come from to create the polygons or the polyhedrons or to create any of these shapes? The platonic solids must be illusions. So you can question 
everything. And in the process of questioning, I bet you're going to have to write in order to find an answer. And there's going to be a style to your writing. And that's going to become your art. There's curves in everything. Start taking apart everything. And you will find the artist in you because that artist will have to express the new understanding that you have. I love that. I think so quickly people are like, well, I can't draw or I can't it's in sing. The book. Girl, right. the, because they put it in the book or, you know, if you sing, you have to sing like this. And I've mm. heard people sing with a hoarse vo voice. Mm. It's not about how pretty your voice sounds. I want to feel you. Mm. I've heard pretty voices, all uh, so many pretty voices, but I felt nothing, mm. you know. So I'd rather hear a raspy voice. I'd rather feel you than hear you. And really, the, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And for so long, in terms of art, the art was monopolized by a certain type of people of a certain persuasion that said this was great and this is worth $20 million. When in essence, it's not about somebody else saying what's, what's beautiful. Art is whatever you make it out of. That's why I'm so passionate about paintings and artists. My father was an artist from Morocco. I'm from North Africa, and I grew up around a lot of paint and saw his struggles as an artist trying to express himself that wasn't represented by a European person or had the means of giving 50% of his art to the dealers, um, in which you know we have many other um, organizations trying to break through that. So with what Terrence and Taraji are saying is that whatever you draw, whatever you express is right. Hmm. And it's so important that you're not, you don't have to believe that you're born with the talent. You develop the talent. It takes work. It takes effort. And I think that's why it's so important to have arts in schools because we can see this creativity, nurture it, develop it, and people just spend time with it. You don't have to be perfect on the first time out. It's a talent you develop over time. Yeah, and you, let it grow. And you've heard the saying, raw talent, right? Mm. That's great, and that's beautiful if you have it, but... It's not going to take you a lot of places in life. Exactly. That's why you have to continue to nurture your talent. And work right. Hard. And work hard. I never stop working. It's like when I write a script, the first draft is not, it doesn't go anywhere. It's not until the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. You just keep working. You never have to be perfect. You just have to keep working towards a goal. He's the showrunner for our show. He oversees most of the scripts, all of the scripts that are written. He oversees the plots of it. She is the producing director who oversees the entire look and looks after all of the directors that work on the show. They work, they both work off of a storyboard, which is created by artists, which is a conception of the overall arc where we want to go with the show. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of intelligence mixed with determination and your own instinct mm -hmm. and artistry. Now, I'm going to say something that you guys are 13, 14, so you're old enough to know that, you know, when a, when a child is conceived, it's over 500 million sperm in a healthy mm -hmm. moment that is sent into that woman. Out of a half billion sperm, you got to that egg. As a woman, it was a 72-hour blind marathon. As a male, it's a 24-hour blind marathon. But you crawled over your own dead brothers and sisters, hundreds of millions of them, <laughs> following your instinct. You didn't look to the left. You didn't look to the right. You trusted your instinct, and it got you, into, got you to that egg. I'm saying if you can win a half billion man race <laughs> yeah. to get to life true, following your instinct, it tells you how powerful your instinct is. And it also solidifies the fact that you are supposed to be here. Bingo. Yes. yes. So, so if you're here, yes. be proud. Yes. yes. And with, with with whether you sing it or whatever you're doing. There was no mistakes. Uh, right. Before we go to the audience for some question, Taraji, I wanted to point out that you have the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation, named after your father, mm -hmm. that's helping to address mental health issues in the black community. Mm -hmm. And there's an art component to that as well, which I loved, where some of the money from your recent fundraiser went to actually go into bathrooms in high schools to put beautiful work there instead of bullying and things that were leading to depression and stuff. Yeah, well, when I was growing up, I don't, you know, it's been a while since I've been in junior high. Like 12 years. Yeah, thank you, Terrence. Thanks. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, the the bathroom was daunting, you know, because you never knew what to expect when you went in there. That's where the grown ups weren't were not there. They weren't in there, so a lot could go on in there. Jumps, get jumped, fights, bullying, people doing and smoking things they shouldn't be. That's how it was for me growing up. So I didn't really like the bathroom, 
you know, and I was a little old squirt. I was a spitfire, but I like <laughs> to avoid issues, you know. A lot of times I would hold my yarn until, you know, I got home. I would make sure the bigger people weren't in there, you know. And so we're trying to change that, shift that, and make it a place of kind of solitude, you know, with nice positive sayings, you know, things to lift you up, change the color. Bathrooms are so drab. They're depressing when you go in there already because, what, they're gray or they're green, you know. Um, so to put that art in there is to, to just start to change the focus of, uh, of the schools, especially in urban communities and then just see the bigger message of just not being ashamed of any stigmas yeah, with well, mental health that too that's being um, ashamed of any stigmas but sometimes people see words before they hear them you know I could you can hear I could hear somebody say be great be great be great but I don't get it until I see it like you said in a certain color or, you know, in a certain hue. Some people, that's how they receive their information. And the thing about schools and children and teaching, it you have to find very creative ways to do that nowadays with social media so prominent. And this is the, the role, like, our videos and our, our artist visits, they really draw attention. I really appreciate what Taraji is saying, that if, if we have that type of powerful uh, support and advocacy, people can, uh, can't just dismiss our schools and our students. And so that really make, it makes a big difference when, when you all draw attention to the needs of the schools. Yeah. I think now's a good time to go to the audience. I think we have a couple of questions. Uh, who do we have first? No? She doesn't want to go first. Hello. There? Um, my group would like to ask, how do you manage the responsibility that comes along with the fame? Um, I know I have little hungry eyes looking at me. I'm also a mother, I have a son. Um, so I'm just pretty much a responsible person. I know I'm very clear on um, why I chose this field of business. And um, I, know, I know the importance of art. I know the importance of my artistry. I know that art can change lives. So I, I went into acting understanding that. So my approach to scripts and things are different. They're from a philanthropic uh, uh, percep perception because that's what I'm here to do, change lives through my art, and I take it that serious. That's why I'm not afraid to play the crackhead or the girl, you know, that was molested, or because these are real stories that can touch and change lives and make people come out of their shell and tell their truth, so. Did I answer your question? Okay, you can clap, you clap for Tim. <laughs> yeah. Will you repeat the question? Because I got caught up with what Taraji was saying. <laughs> um, how do you manage the responsibility and pressure that comes with fame? Well, I personally feel that fame is something that's, um, that's unnatural for human beings because I've never really seen somebody successfully handle it. You take good people and you put them in a famous situation and they don't know how to deal with it and you end up putting on airs. Even I find myself doing Terrence Howard impersonations, you know, with people that I meet thinking I gotta behave a particular way. So the only way to do it is you have to go home and you have to have a pretty good picture of who you are, a mental picture of who you are. And remember at the end of the day that you're no bigger than one of God's children and no less than one of God's children. And, and something my father used to always say to me, if you know who you are, no one can use you against you. Bingo. Yeah. So don't be afraid to live in your truth, whatever that is, whatever it looks like. Don't compare yourself to other people. Stay in your lane. Put your blindfolders on because first thing you start looking over to somebody's lane, you try to go as fast as them. You try to wear the same clothes as them. That's not why God created you. You are all look different for a reason. You are all different, have different makeup for a reason. You know, so walk with, that's prideful. Have pride in that. That's Live in your truth and don't apologize for who you are and where you come from. You hear what I'm saying to you? Don't ever apologize, okay? It's about... We, it does never, it's never about where you started. It's never about where you started. It's always where you're going. Always keep looking forward. Don't look back. And remember what you learned in the womb. Get to the egg. <laughs> get to the egg. Don't listen to nobody. You get to the egg. <laughs> Hashtag get to the egg. <laughs> Next question. That's what I thought about when you did that, turning up to the side. My question is, what inspired you to do the, um, to do acting? 
Um, arts programs in school. We used to have this uh, traveling art group that would go to different schools in the urban area where I was from, Washington, D.C., and they were an acting troupe. And they would put on little, like, five-minute little performances. And I just remember going, I want to do that. I, I, I want to do that. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I want to do it. And that's the thing about humans. We, we inspire each other. That's why it's so important for you to tell your story. And when I became an actress, it was more than just being an actress for me. I'm going back to the whole responsibility thing. Because we know how many, we know so many people that are talented and they have talent out the wazoo, but yet they don't have the mic. Mm -hmm. So when God gives you the mic, you better have something to say mm -hmm. to the people. Otherwise, the mic can be taken. Quick. So understand, in art, in life, we all have to be responsible. I don't care whether you're in front of the camera, behind the camera, you have to be responsible in life, period. Mm -hmm. Whatever you go into. Next question. What are some strategies you use in order to memorize your lines? <laughs> well, before that, I want to know you guys' names. What was your name? Jade, good to meet you. Danielle Brooks. Danielle Brooks. Janelle Camacho. Very good to meet you. Now ask the question. <laughs> Sorry. What are some strategies you use in order to memorize your line? I never go into it as I got to learn my lines because it's never about the words. It's never about the words. It's what's behind the words. It's what's going on to make you say the words. So first, as an actor, I have to figure out. And then you have to take into consideration the writer. Why did the writer write this? And I have to say it like this, so let me do my research and figure out where I am in the story. See, there's so much you have to do before you even get to memorizing the lines. I need to read the script. What is this story about? Who are these people I'm interacting with? What are they saying about me? See, once you learn the story and you know where you are in the story, the lines will come to you. With ease. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Thank you. So never pick up a script and go, my lines, my lines, because you will choke every time because you won't know what you're talking about. You're just spitting yeah. out lines. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Hi, my name is Jeff Monique, and my question is, during the early stage of your career as an actor, have you ever felt stage fright or nervousness, especially with talking in front of crowds, and how have you get dealt with that? I've had stage fright a number of times, but again, um, you've got to remember that nothing in the universe happens by accident. As Taraji said earlier, God put you here for a reason. So the moment that you realize, oh, well, I guess I'm supposed to be nervous right here. The moment you recognize, oh, I'm nervous, and you say it's okay to be nervous, you give yourself permission to be a little uncomfortable, because I promise you, nothing looks more unnatural than an attempt to look natural. Mm -hmm. So if you are uncomfortable for a minute, let it happen. And That'd express be, it. Laugh about it and be like, wow, I'm, I'm a little nervous. I've been on stage with the <laughs> mic in my hand, and I'd be like, y'all, I'm nervous. And you know what? It breaks the ice. Everybody go, ooh, yeah, me too. You <laughs> No, so usually those feelings that you're having, those are natural feelings. Don't shun them. Embrace them. And know this about life, okay? Let's, let's, because everything you do, art imitates life, right? So in life, you have fear. It doesn't have to be because you get up in front of a stage. But what you need to, to, to choose a side right now, you know, life is spiritual warfare, Okay? That's why you have negative. That's why you have positive. That's why you have daylight and you have night. That sun is constantly chasing the moon like this, right? You have hate. You have love. You have good. You have bad. So as humans, we have to wake up every day. This is an everyday struggle for every human. Which side am I on today? Am I going to give in to fear? Or am I going to stay on the faith side? Now, what I do know is that fear and faith cannot coexist. So you have to choose your side. I'm not going to say that once you choose faith side that that fear ain't going to creep in. You just have to recognize it, embrace it, breathe it out, and keep it moving. Speak on it. Call it out. Hey, I see you. I see you, fear. 
I know you guys are talking to the kids, but I'm just, my heart is so full right now. I feel like I'm learning so much to be a better adult and to be a better person. So thank you for that. Um, also, I know that the season five of Empire yeah. is coming out on Wednesday. We're all really excited to see it. I want to talk a, a little bit about it, but first I think we have a trailer, so let's check that out first. Empire Returns. Empire Returns. Empire Season 5. Empire Season 5 is new life. It just feels different, like something has been completely shaken up. We ended last season and everybody was in jeopardy. Everybody got shot and you're like, whoa, what's happening? No! Who is in the coffin? I want to know. It's got to be one of the lions, right? I don't know. I sure as hell hope it's not me. I pray to God it ain't me. Sorry. Empire season five is back, and we're fast forwarding to two years later. The Lions, they lost everything. No, they stop. They're broke. The Lions have lost everything that they thought made them what they were. But Lucius and Cookie, they're great. They just ain't got no money, you know? <laughs> Cookie and Lucius's relationship has definitely been tested time and time again. You can't have one without the other. That seems to be the general consensus from the fans. <laughs> Come on, baby. I'm so sick and tired of people taking things from us. Let's take back what's ours. So we love Forrest Whitaker. Maybe uh, a little more than a little. <laughs> but we can't stand Eddie Barker. It's time he gets what he deserves. What is it you want? What do you want? Same thing you wanted. I want Empire. The family, their legacy has to find a way to survive. So this entire season, I think, will be about them finding the lions within their own heart. May we rise. Like always. This is definitely lions against the world, but the lions are finally the underdogs. <laughs> plaid suit. That's you vibrating over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I just say that that plaid suit is from what? Um, season two? And it's season five and I can still fit it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to say that. Okay. <laughs> As a viewer, I'm pumped for this season because it almost is like going back to the beginning where we saw where they were young and scrappy and having to build this and there they are again. And so I, I'm just so excited. I know you're not going to tell us what happens, but can you give us, like, what is the vibe of this season? I think what, what I love, what I love about it is that for four seasons, Cookie was like, give me what's mine. You owe me this, you owe me that. Help me, help, give me mine. And this fifth season, Lucius knows he needs her. So now you get to see the family, the family as a collective. See, the first four, you were stabbing each other in the back, mm. trying to kill each other. This fifth season, now you see the family come together as a collective and build their own empire, another empire that's probably going to be better and stronger than the one that exists. But the message I love is the same thing that's going on with the whole Kaepernick campaign. Mm -hmm. You have to be bold enough and fearless enough to walk away from it all if you know who you are mm -hmm. and what you have to offer. And, and the lion, well, Cookie knew. Cookie knew that that building is just a shell of a building without the lions in there. <laughs> Also, I liked her, his proposal. She was like, you got to put me first. Like, she also added that in there. Yeah. Like, we're doing this together this time, okay? You can't just be leaving me in the dust. Right. So that, that was an important part to Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> like, I think it's a metaphor for how life really works. You know, oftentimes there's this big battle between people. And in a family, you know, there's... Everybody has a role to play. And when that role is well played by everyone within the family, the family benefits and prospers. But everyone has to come together and stick together. And you, in order to do that, you have to have the right person for your mate. Don't be out there just picking any pretty or happy person or somebody that look like they got it going on. If you pick the wrong mate, you can be stuck with them for the rest of your life in an unhappy situation. And when you have hard times, they become miserable times. So make sure you pick the right mate because apparently Lucius and Cookie mm -hmm. picked the right mate yeah. with each other. <laughs> because we can war, but there's an overwhelming love that mm -hmm. our family will We'll work together and we'll overcome. But without that love, you will fall apart. So if you have any doubts about the person you're thinking about being with in the future when you get ready to get married, take the time to explore that 
and don't marry the wrong person. I'm sorry if that seems off, but I felt like I needed to say it. But that's what this year proves on Empire, that we made the right choice in finding each other. And it's also just nice to take the material things away from the lions and see that that's not really what bound them together. What bound them together was their love and their kinship and their family, and that's what they're really relying on this season. Well, Cookie was a little salty. She had to give up them furs. <laughs> that was a sad thing. That was sad. Like snatching her bowls, but okay. Well, I want to make sure that viewers know that they can also uh, get involved with some philanthropy by watching Empire. You guys have a campaign going on called Empire Star Gives Back. And for everybody who tweets using that hashtag, $2, up to $50,000 will go to Turnaround Arts to fund some of their programs. Yeah. So watch, thank you, thank tweet, you. get involved. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, arts education is obviously something really important. I think it's important that we continue to speak about it. So thank you guys again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so guys. much. Thank you.